Hi, this is Dr. Kat Vlies with video N on the respiratory system. Here we're going to take a look at the factors that impact external respiration. Aside from the partial pressures of the gases and their solubilities, we're also going to have to take a look at the structure of the respiratory membrane in order to better understand gas exchange in the lungs. And then finally, something we refer to as ventilation-perfusion coupling. Let's first focus on the gases, partial pressures, and solubilities, starting out with oxygen. So by the time the blood returns to the heart, we'll refer to that blood as the venous blood, it's rather oxygen poor, and it has, therefore, a partial pressure for oxygen of about 40. In the alveoli, on the other hand, the partial pressure, remember, is about 100. This is a pretty nice and steep gradient between the two pressure areas, that is the blood and the alveoli. And so we're going to see that equilibrium is reached pretty quickly between the alveolar environment and the venous and the blood. It only takes a quarter of a second for equilibrium to be reached, despite the fact that our blood actually stays three, three times longer than it needs in order to um, get oxygenated. In other words, in order for um, equilibrium to be reached between the alveoli and the blood. If we now take a look at carbon dioxide, the venous blood that returns to the heart is going to be carbon dioxide rich. And so it's going to have a partial pressure of about 45. The air that we inhaled at then, and that mixed with the dead air leads, us, leads to a partial pressure for carbon dioxide in the alveoli of about 40. So this time we do not have a very steep partial pressure gradient at all between the blood and the alveoli for carbon dioxide. But recall that carbon dioxide is about 20 times more soluble than oxygen. And this high level of solubility is going to compensate for this poor pressure gradient. As a matter of fact, because carbon dioxide is so much more soluble, we see that for each oxygen molecule, we exchange one carbon dioxide, despite this very low pressure gradient for carbon dioxide and a very high pressure gradient um, for oxygen. So for each oxygen molecule that is um, going to move, we're going to move one carbon dioxide molecule. Let's apply all these partial pressure numbers along with the solubility properties of the various gases to this diagram. First of all, when we look at this diagram, notice that we have the heart here with its four chambers. The two vena cavae are bringing blood, oxygen poor blood back to the heart, to the right atrium, and from the right atrium we go into the right ventricle. From the right ventricle the blood is pushed up through the pulmonary trunk into the um, pulmonary arteries. So the pulmonary arteries, remember, are oxygen poor. Then gas exchange occurs in the lungs that we refer to as external respiration, so that by the time the blood leaves the lungs, we can see that here via the pulmonary veins, that blood will actually return to the left side of the heart, go down into the left ventricle, and the left ventricle that can then push the blood out via the aorta. And the aorta is now going to carry oxygen-rich blood to the rest of the body. Okay, so now let's apply, like I said, all these numbers to this diagram. Notice that I have several boxes shown in which I list partial pressures. If we start here with the air that we inspire, these numbers should look from familiar. Remember, we're assuming we're at sea level, and so the partial pressure for oxygen is approximately 160. The partial pressure for carbon dioxide, almost zero. 
this air that we inspire is going to be mixed with dead space air. There's some condensation occurring. And consequently, in the alveoli, we're seeing that the partial pressures for these two gases has changed some. We see a decrease in the partial pressure for oxygen to 100, while the partial pressure for carbon dioxide has come up to about 40. So this is the air mixture inside of the alveoli. So let's stop there for a moment because it's this air in the alveoli that is now going to come in contact with the blood in the capillaries that is um, provided by these, uh, this blood is provided, I should say, into these capillaries by the pulmonary arteries. So the pulmonary arteries, don't forget, they are basically moving all of this blood from the superior and inferior vena cava into the lungs. So the pulmonary arteries are carrying our oxygen-poor blood. That oxygen-poor blood has a partial pressure for oxygen of 40 um, towards the lungs. So we see a pretty nice steep pressure gradient. The blood in the capillaries that is reaching the lungs is still oxygen poor, but by the time it makes it to the alveoli, we see that pressure gradient here, and consequently oxygen will diffuse out of the alveoli into our blood. The partial pressure for carbon dioxide in these pulmonary arteries is going to be at about, and I should have added this here, is going to be about 45. And you'll see where I get this number from in just a moment. Notice that the gradient, maybe I should have written this in, in black so you can see it better. Notice that the gradient for carbon dioxide between the alveoli and the incoming blood is not as great. But remember, we learned that's not a problem because carbon dioxide has such a high solubility. So for each oxygen that is going to leave our alveoli to enter into our blood, we're going to see that a carbon dioxide molecule will enter the alveol alveoli from our blood. So by the time the blood leaves our lungs via the pulmonary veins, better shown here, our blood is now oxygen rich. It has a partial pressure for oxygen of 100. Remember, that's what we saw here in the alveoli. So the air has equilibrated between the alveolar space and the blood. And we see also that the carbon dioxide partial pressure is going to be that what, as what it was in the alveoli. So this will be 40. So the blood leaving the lungs is oxygen rich and it's going to enter into the aorta with these partial pressures here. It's on its way to the tissues now and notice here that I'm showing you these same partial pressures. So I'm just carrying these numbers further down here to make sure that you remember these are the partial pressures of the gases in the blood that are going to approach the tissue cells now. So, so far we've looked at external respiration in the lungs. Now we might as well already talk about uh, internal respiration which occurs at the level of the tissues. So our tissue cells have been busy, busy, busy metabolizing and so the tissue cells, their environment is oxygen poor. So we have a partial pressure for oxygen of 40, but we're accumulating carbon dioxide. So the partial pressure for carbon dioxide in the tissues is relatively high, 45. Now compare these pressures or partial pressures. So the blood entering into the tissues has a partial pressure for oxygen of 100. In the tissues, it's 40. So this is a nice pressure gradient to where our oxygen is going to go into the tissue cells. And vice versa, uh, 
for carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has a partial pressure of 40 in the blood that's arriving. It is 45 in the tissue cells, but we have such a high solubility for carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide is going to leave the tissue cells and easily enter into our bloodstream. Remember, for each molecule of oxygen that diffuses, one molecule of carbon dioxide diffuses, despite their major changes, major differences in pressure gradients. And so this was internal respiration, gas exchange at the level of the tissues. So the blood that's now leaving these tissue cells is oxygen poor. We're back down to a partial pressure of 40 for oxygen, while that for carbon dioxide is 45, and that should, um, these numbers correspond to what we looked at earlier, the numbers in the pulmonary arteries, and we can start all over again. So once again, inside the lungs, where we see that gas exchange occurs between the alveoli and the capillaries, that we refer to as external respiration. On the other hand, when gas exchange occurs between blood and the tissues, we call that internal respiration.